The purpose of this short video is to describe the development of uh, the Bohr model. Um, when Niels Bohr developed his model of the hydrogen atom, uh, it was in the, the early 1900s, and, and at the time of his uh, proposal, um, basically what scientists had settled on at the time was called uh, the nuclear atom. And um, the, the, the nuclear atom, or the evidence that came out supporting the nuclear model, uh, came from Rutherford's lab and the famous uh, gold foil experiment. Basically, the nuclear model stated that the atom was composed of a hard, dense core at its center with a positive charge, and um, that the electrons were, were revolving around this hard, dense center, which we call a nucleus, in circular orbits. Um, nobody really understood what the condition of the electrons were, um, how far away from the nucleus they were, whether or not they were actually in circular orbits or not, um, um, how to determine their energies and so on. So the, Bohr, the development of the Bohr model was a major uh, step forward in this process. Now, as I go through this, uh, one of the assumptions that I'm going to make out of the gate um, is that uh, we're going to treat the electron as if it, it, as if it is a light wave, as if it is a wave. And the reason that we're going to do that is because the electron is very small and it's going really fast, approximately three quarters the speed of uh, the speed of light. And so the truth of the matter is, is that the electron operates more like a wave than it does a particle. So, th so, so that's an important thing to keep in the back of your mind as we go forward. Now, what were people doing at the time to try and understand what was going on um, with the electrons in atoms? So various scientists uh, were taking uh, various kinds of elements, metal, um, 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 pure metals, um, me metal salts, and so on, and, and they were basically abusing these compounds um, and then um, studying uh, the effects or the results that they got from these various experiments. And so I want to point out a, a number of key things uh, that, that started to develop evidence that eventually Bohr looked at and, and utilized in order to create his model. So the first thing, the first thing is, is that if you take solid metals and you heat them up, it was discovered that, that they tend to vibrate at definite frequencies. They vibrate at, at definite frequencies. And I, I'll talk about, at, first what I'm gonna do is take you through the, the evidence here, and then we'll talk about what it means. So if you take a, a metal and you heat it up, that particular metal vibrates um, with, with de uh, definite frequencies, uh, a definite resonance. Then there's this, a concept called the photoelectric effect that was described by um, Einstein. And in that case, what he learned is that you can take certain metals and irradiate those metals. So shine a, a light onto those metals. Um, and if you, you shine um, certain wavelengths of light on certain metals, you can cause electrons um, to be ejected from that particular metal. Um, whereas a light of that same wavelength can be uh, used to irradiate a different kind of metal and, and nothing happens. So, so what Einstein learned was that you, you can irradiate certain metals with certain wavelengths of light and in those cases electrons escape, um, but the light wave used is specific to a specific kind of metal. All right. Um, an example of this is that um, electrons can be ejected from potassium with violet light, but, but light um, with, red, with wavelengths that, that correlate in the red part of the visible um, spectrum have no effect. You, you also can take um, pure gases like helium, neon, and so on, uh, hydrogen or nitrogen gas, for example, um, and you can heat those gases up, and it turns out, um, or, or um, in addition to heating, you can also run electric current through them, and when you do that, it was discovered that those particular gases will produce light. The interesting thing, though, is that they only produce light of certain wavelengths. So nitrogen pr produces light waves when heated or an electrical current is run through it, which is different than, for example, helium or neon. So different elements, different elemental gases, produce different light spectrums when they're, when they're heated or when an electrical current is run through them. 
certain salts when they're heated, um, like for example, sodium chloride or, or lithium nitrate, when those kinds of salts are, are heated, they produce very specific lights that they give off or that they radiate outward, all right? So the take home message here is that different elements respond to light in different ways. When they're, when they're heated or when an electrical current is run through them, they can be made to produce light. And when they do, the light that a particular element produces is unique uh, to that material. Now, before we go on about this, I want to remind you of um, some basics that have to do with charges. Um, oppositely, charges oppositely charged particles attract one another. That's, this is what is called electrostatic force. In order to, to separate oppositely charged particles, you, you have to put energy into the system because you, you have to, to put in, essentially, a force to separate the two um, oppositely charged particles from one another. So it requires an input of energy to do this. Remember that um, electrons are waves. So um, the, the basic idea here is that since light waves can be used to cause electrons to be ejected from metal. Since you can heat these materials up and, and, um, and these materials will produce light that, are, that, that uh, has, have light waves that are specific to certain colors, then it follows that um, the energy that's being put into the system there is being utilized to separate electrons away from, from the proton. The, the origin of the light most likely has to do with the fact that, that when the electron moves back into the position where it's closest to the proton and that energy has to be released, the energy is coming off as light. And that just is shown here in this simple equation where we have energy which is equal to uh, the frequency of the light either being absorbed or released. Don't worry about this H, that's just a constant that's called Planck's constant. And the frequency is related to the wavelength of the light the light that, that we see when, when the light is being released from these um, metals um, and compounds and light that is being absorbed to cause these transitions. Now, what we want to talk about here is what the information means that I gave you. This idea that irradiating uh, a metal, for example, will eject electrons from one type of metal but not another the fact that metals vibrate with one type of frequency and not others, um, the fact that you can take salts of various metals like lithium chloride, um, sodium nitrate as examples, um, heat them up and they produce light that is very specific um, to, to those metal cations. So what's going on with this? All right, if we put energy into a system and we separate the particle, if the electron has any energy level, um, any, any energy position that it wants, then it follows that, that basically that material, um, we should be able to eject electrons from that material using any wavelength of light we want because th that would suggest that the electron has an infinite number of energy possibilities available to it. All right, so by irradiating a compound, irradiating a metal, we should be able to cause electrons um, to, to move uh, um, irrespective of the wavelength that we're using. And then when, when that electron moves back down to, to the position where it's bound again to the proton, then the energy release should, be, should come off as light and the light that's released should be any, wa any wavelength, uh, any wavelength that, that, that the electron wants because it would have any position, an infinite number of positions. Yet this kind of model doesn't fit the data because the data indicates that only certain wavelengths of light cause certain electrons from a particular metal to be ejected, or um, only um, certain um, colors are um, emitted from a particular kind of salt when you heat it up. That's more consistent with this kind of model. And what I'm showing here is that we start with the electron bound to the proton. Um, the, the electron can be moved to certain energy levels, all right, certain energy levels, and only if enough energy is inputted to drive the electron all the way to this ledge. And then 
because the electron is, is in an excited state, it tumbles back down, and when it does, the energy that correlates with this gap, with this exact gap, is released, and we see only a certain color of light. So this kind of model is uh, one that shows energy as being stepped, is, is uh, consistent with the kind of data that scientists were seeing in the early 1900s. Now, what we're going to do is cut away to a demonstration. You'll actually be carrying out this experiment in the laboratory. And, and what this is associated with is um, we're, we're going to have a lithium salt, a sodium salt, and a barium salt in different beakers. Alcohol is added to each one of these. And then the, the alcohol was ignited using a flame. And what, you, what you'll see in the video is that each of the three salts has a completely unique coloration that's being emitted or that's being um, radiated into the room. All right, and so what I want you to do is take a look. Uh, we're going to cut away to that to that demonstration. I want you to take a look at it. All right, and um, when we come back, then we'll talk about the Bohr model.